Situated in the rolling countryside of Todd County, stands the 351-foot obelisk memorial to Kentucky-born Jefferson Davis, an indelible reminder of the larger-than-life controversial first and only president of the Confederacy. It's hard to tell the story of Davis without including comparisons to his fellow Kentuckian, Abraham Lincoln. Here's Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, both born in a log cabin, born within eight months and 80 miles of each other, not too far separated from each other in background and families. One goes north, one goes south. What well, would the course of American history had been at the two reverse directions? You know, how much is a person a product of their environment? How much is a person a product of heredity? But they do go north and south, and they become eventually the leaders of two causes, one who wants a united nation, one who wants a new nation. They come out of the same background, same origins in a lot of ways, but they emerge very different men as a result. Although Davis's family moved south when he was two years old, Kentucky would play a prominent role in Davis's early education. Davis, at first glance, has very few ties to Kentucky. He's born here. He leaves here when he's a young boy, less than probably two years old. So in that sense, he's not influenced by Kentucky as long as Lincoln was. But in another sense, he was more influenced by Kentucky than Lincoln was because he came to Kentucky for much of his schooling. He comes to Kentucky because Kentucky was known as the educational center of the South at the time. Jefferson Davis's father, Samuel Davis, somehow recognized that he had a very intelligent son as his 10th son. And he was not satisfied with the schooling in uh, Woodville, Mississippi. And therefore he sent him to boarding school, which is unusual in America, up in Kentucky to Springfield to St. Thomas Academy. As he starts out with an education in Kentucky, comes back to Kentucky for his college school at Transylvania, which is one of the best schools in the South at that time. Following Transylvania, Davis went on to West Point and then service in the Army. It was there that he met and fell in love with Sarah Knox Taylor, the Kentucky-born daughter of his commander and future president, Zachary Taylor. Tragically, illness struck the couple three months after they married. They're visiting relatives down in the depths of the swampy south and Louisiana, and they both contract either yellow fever or malaria. There's some question about which one it was. It was a serious disease, and Davis is on his sick bed, and he hears his wife singing a favorite song of theirs. He goes to her thinking she has recovered from her illness. She dies in his arms. Davis was never the same man after that. Davis, after that, goes into seclusion, lives on his plantation, reading books, surrounded by his slaves, seeing almost no one for years and years. Davis went on to fight in the Mexican-American War and rose to become one of the South's political leaders. Davis was really well prepared to be a president of the Confederacy. He was a cosmopolitan man. Uh, he had been a secretary of war. He'd been a senator, one of the best educated men in the South. The burden of responsibility for secession added to the strain of Davis's numerous physical and emotional ailments, painting a portrait of a man often in pain. Davis was wounded in the, in the Mexican War. His, he was shot in the foot and was on crutches for two years. He had lost the vision in one eye that he was probably blind by the end of the Civil War. Davis also had pain from nerve damage, neuralgia, they called it at the time. This is a man in constant pain. He probably also has insomnia. Four of his six children died before Davis does, and all of his sons died before Davis. So here's a man of strong will. He has to overcome all these physical ailments, but they had to wear on him. They had to tear on his emotions. They had to tear on his physique, his stature. President Davis certainly uh, suffered as much as any other American political leader ever has. When the note came that he had been elected president of the Confederacy, his wife, Irina, was standing with him in the Rose Garden, and she said his facial expression looked like he was reading a death notice. And uh, then he told her, and to him, this responsibility fell on him. And it was a great, great, and great responsibility. While the history books eventually praised Abraham Lincoln's role in preserving the country, Jefferson Davis's legacy is clouded in controversy. He was a man who soon 
went into uh, eclipse. Now he was popular in the South, Don't, you can't say that, but he was not, many places celebrated Lee's birthday, not Davis's birthday. Yes, he's honored, but he's not loved. And he never was really loved. He was revered by some, but never the man that people could embrace and say, this is our president, this is the man that led us in the war. But then over time, they, what Davis stood for became much more uh, unacceptable. A man that, who stood for slavery, at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, that stand seemed so outdated. It became a, a, a point of controversy. Jefferson Davis's legacy changes, as does the Civil War. We've come a long way. Davis would be very pleased that the Union has survived. In his speeches, he emphasized the, the value of the Union. He would always point out that uh, states' rights relates to the Union, and he wanted to preserve the Union. He said the saddest day of his life was when he resigned from the Senate to go south and then to later be elected uh, Confederate president. Saddest day of his life to resign from the Union, actually. Shortly before his death, Davis made one last journey to Kentucky to commemorate the dedication of a church on the location of his birthplace. He said, uh, it is with a heart full of emotion that I thank you for commemorating the spot of my nativity. I feel like today, like the poem that Sir Walter Scott wrote, this is my own, my native land. And then the last thing he said was, God bless Kentucky and Bethel Baptist Church. <laughs>